Hey, look, it's the double wide dudes. All right, all right. Welcome back to another episode of the Double Wide Dudes, our first episode of 2022. And today we're joined by our guest, Peter Calthor. Peter, thanks for joining us. Hey, you're welcome. Anybody who's after affordable housing is on my side. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, for our audience, um, Peter's an architect, an urban designer, and an urban planner, and he's taught all over the place. UC Berkeley, University of Washington, U- University of Oregon, and the University of North Carolina. Uh, Peter's a founding member of the Congress for New Urbanism and an advocacy group form that promotes sustainable building practices, some of which we'll get in um, here in a bit. Um, Peter received the the Urban and Land Institute's prestigious J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development um, and was named one of the top 25 innovators on the cutting edge by Newsweek uh, magazine. So really excited to dive into this, to talk about a a topic, Peter, we just haven't really addressed too, too much on the podcast, which is transit-oriented development. Um, I guess to start us off, Peter, what what is transit-oriented development? Well, you, you, it's the realization that transportation and housing and uh, communities are all linked in in profound ways, and you can't solve for one without solving for all of them. So the kind of housing you choose and where it's placed impacts the transportation system, either positively or negative, or in the economics of the household in a pretty profound way. You know, everybody's used to the affordability issue around housing, you know, 30% of household income can go to it. Uh, that's kind of the target of qualifying. Um, a lot of low income households can't, uh, you know, can't fit that budget and they end up at 40 and 50% of household income going into housing. But on top of that is 20 to 30% of household budget going to transportation. And when you link the two, for, for almost everybody, it's over 50%. It's, it's kind of an astounding aggregation. And so the old model, which was we're going to build subdivisions out on cheap land and we're going to use basic construction and, uh, you know, thereby get, deliver not affordable housing, but um, workforce housing you might want to call it. Uh, And then, of course, there's, you know, big lots with expensive houses and, you know, there's a whole variety. But the most of, you know, the middle class housing of America was subdivisions. Well, as our metropolitan regions grew and grew and grew, those subdivisions got farther and farther away and the transportation costs mounted. And in a way, that's what drove the 2008 collapse was people really not being able to afford, afford the old paradigm of uh, drive till you qualify, as you said. So a lot of us has been talking about infill housing for a long time, putting higher density housing closer to jobs, closer to services. Now, you you might say, well, everybody, it's the American dream, a single family dwelling. Yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of people who are willing to make a trade-off and say, gee, if I don't have to spend two hours, three hours a day driving, Maybe it's worth living in a townhouse or maybe it's worth living in a condo, but we just don't allow for much infill. And that therein lies the crisis. Now, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of analysis we did in California on the housing crisis there, which, of course, is is much bigger than it is in Texas. Uh, And it's because we don't allow infill housing. Uh, And of course, we make it difficult to build any kind of housing in California. But, you know, if we're going to solve our housing crisis and there may be parallels in Texas sooner or later, you you know, we're going to have to figure out how to get infill housing built. The idea is to take our underutilized commercial strips and infill uh, housing over shops, mixed use development. Um, The beauty of it is, of course, that it distributes the housing kind of in a linear fashion through every community, more often than not in the more mature communities where the jobs are. And it also gives us the the opportunity to take those those, uh, arterials and upgrade them into boulevards with transit. So there's space for transit and space for housing in a distributed system that that is kind of uh, infill at large. So this idea is one I've been working on for decades. Um, And we have a bunch of pilot cities that have picked it up and they've been pretty much zoned all of their uh, arterial strip commercial areas for mixed use. And lo and behold, private developers move in on small lots and big lots and and they go to town and they build really great mixed use. And 
all of a sudden, instead of just an arterial corridor, uh, you get a place that's really lived in, safe and interesting, filled with cafes and things like that. So and that's how it used to be. I mean, my I remember my nana telling stories. Her her father owned a you know small grocery shop in the community, and they lived above it, and the shop was below it, and that that's how her whole town was. I was reading this is something you've been working on since the early '90s. What what was going on at that time that led to this and has that changed now, gotten better, worse, or what have you seen over the years? Well, you know, a long time ago, I wrote a book called Sustainable Communities. And in that book, we began to realize that just spreading outward at low density was never going to work environmentally or socially that well. A lot of people argue whether or not it's socially successful. Um, but sure enough, in terms of affordability, it doesn't work. Right. And so uh, I've been working on that idea since. I, I worked for the state of California and did a, a kind of statewide scenario process uh, called Vision California way back in the 90s, where we said, look, if the state continues to grow as we've been growing with subdivision after subdivision farther and farther away, let's compare that to an infill future for California. And sure enough, all the significant metrics came way down. The water consumption, the congestion, the air quality, the health impacts, the household costs came down by $10,000 per household. And so it's like, you know, a 20% reduction in household costs. That's a, that's a big number. And then there's carbon emissions and all sorts of other, you know, dimensions to the problem. And we were able to uh, identify all them. And so ever since that time, there's been a very fairly large group trying to see, well, what is systemically the problem with infill? Why can't we get it done? And, you know, there's a lot of answers to that reason. We have a deficit of 2 million units in California. I mean, it's beyond a crisis. And in the next 15 years, we're going to need another 15 million. So, and our housing affordability is only 50% of the current population can afford to buy or rent. I mean, it's just we're losing it. Everybody's pointing a finger at California saying we're overregulated, and overtaxed, and but we're still a place that generates an amazing quantity of jobs. And if we could just solve the housing problem, we'd be in a more equitable, strong, and sustainable position. Take the Bay Area. Uh, in the last decade, or you know, last, from 10 to eight, uh, 18, we created 880,000 jobs and only built 114,000 units of housing. So um, this is the, uh, the epicenter of the problem right here. The solution, as I was outlining, is taking underutilized strip commercial, and you know, because of Amazon, uh, you know, and our new lifestyles that came out of COVID, people are not cruising down the strip to go shopping. They're doing it online. So we've got just a tremendous amount of land that's dormant, not generating decent taxes, and becoming a blight, literally, on our communities. Um, we can infill with a range of housing types. I'm not going to get into the TIF, the tax increment financing, but you know, when you generate um, more property value, you generate more property tax. It's smaller than Texas. I think Texas is like 3% residential tax, and we're just at 1%. But it still generates a lot more taxes, which then can be recycled to pay for transit and affordable housing and all the other good things. So it's a self-correcting and reinforcing. What we need is as of right zoning. We need to basically say, I don't care what city you're in, the richest Palo Alto in the heart of Silicon Valley or, or Oakland, you know, uh, you have to have the same rights so that so that all the entitlements don't get trapped in an endless cycle of, of approvals and reviews and, and redesigns. There has to be an inclusionary element. If the state's going to say, as of right, and by the way, the whole idea of as of right zoning, it's been done all over the United States. New York, all of New York is as of right. If you're a developer there and you build according to the existing plan, you can just take your construction documents in and get them approved as long as they're you know, <laughs> structurally sound and all the rest of that. Um, and you don't have all this waiting and environmental impacts and community groups protesting and you know, trying to change the nature of the thing. So as of right is, is a real, uh, it's a solid, simple idea that makes, puts a lot of the appropriate land in play 
to solve the housing problem. Inclusionary just means, hey, when you build it, you got to include affordable housing. So we don't want to just have a set of affordable housing enclaves here and there. We want to distribute it. So within each one, it's 15 percent. And then the tax increment financing I was just telling you about is all about how we can get the public value of redeveloping these places and use that for all the good things we want. So the first thing I looked at was a famous street, El Camino. It runs through the heart of Silicon Valley from San Francisco down to San Jose. Mm -hmm. I used to live on in Palo Alto, so I know it very well. And uh, I asked the question, well, on El Camino, how, many, how much strip commercial land is there and how many units of housing could we fit? And here's the astounding answer. One road, 250,000 units of housing, the housing that's right at the heart of where all the jobs are always being created, you know, so nobody's commuting. And it's a big enough street to put a BRT transit system down. So I really changed my idea of what TOD is. It used to be a light rail system, a station, and then a walking radius around the station. And now it's becoming this linear kind of urbanism that's attached to a network of BRT systems. That's what El Camino looks like. I mean, look at that. That is underutilized land in the most valuable place in the United States, you might say. And so the idea that all that could get redone, it's a, no, it's, it's a no brainer. Pri the private sector would gobble it up immediately. We've seen it over and over again. Oops. What's been the reception on, on this thus, thus far? Is that something people are open to or are you getting pushback? Or? Wherever, wherever there's a zoning that allows it, it gets built. So there are individual cities like Menlo Park and Redwood City and a few others. These are all names that aren't related to you guys. But, you know, there are lots of places where they just do it because they think it's a good idea for their town mm -hmm. and it gets built and it, it, it is a good idea. So this is El Camino today. It's not, you know, this is kind of scene you guys got plenty of in Texas, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, this is what it could be. So big sidewalks, bike lanes, you still have lanes for cars, and then there's a BRT system, bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit? Yeah. It's the most affordable form of really good, high-quality transit. We're getting to a point where light rail is too expensive mm -hmm. for anybody to build at 100 a mile, 100 million a mile, excuse me. Oh, wow. Uh, and, you know, bus rapid transit has dedicated lanes so the buses aren't stuck in traffic, and they have technology to, sit, to manipulate the, the lights at the intersection so they can flow freely. In other words, they have priority in the Very intersection. Um, and so they really create an advantage. You can travel faster than in your car. Now, nobody's going to give up their car if they're going slower on transit. Right. So right. the key here is a dedicated right-of-way. But I, I'll talk a little more about that later in this talk. So this is an overview of what El Camino could look like when you build out the housing and you have the ground floor shops and cafes. And there down the middle, you can see the the um, the BRT. The technology today, it's already developed in China, is autonomous buses. So on these dedicated protected right of ways, it's very easy to run auto autonomous technology. So when we looked at the whole of the Bay Area, all the arterials, there's about 700 miles of arterials in the Bay Area and about 15,000 acres of strip commercial land. And if we upzoned all that to mixed use, we'd get 1.4 million units of housing. And the beauty of it is that that housing sits closer to jobs than any new subdivision is ever going to get a shot at in this. So it's a different kind of TOD. It's a network of uh, linear places and linear transit ways. There's the, uh, there's the, uh, the network of, of uh, arterials. Down to your right, just people may not have the same geography that we have. That, that's San Jose on the right and San Francisco on the left. And, Ber and Oakland's up there underneath the bars right now. Um, El Camino is still in the foreground running between the two. What's amazing is that if you compare the average house that sits on a grand boulevard to the average house in a subdivision, water use is down 62%, energy use is down 40%, the amount of driving is down 55%, the greenhouse gases 50%, and household costs, that's transportation and utilities, 
down 53%. So it's better for the environment and it's better for people on every level. Yeah, and that, that household cost, that, that's the real tie-in to the affordable housing conversation, right? If yeah, the yeah, house yeah. costs less to build, but you know, you're having to pay for gas and fuel and a car to drive an hour or hour and a half each day to work, you know, the overall cost of living in that um, is is out of reach for a lot of people in terms of, of Oh, no, the stress is, you know, it's like a domino effect. When one group can't afford a house, they move down to the next level. They move down to the next level. And before you know, it's it's fallen over to the point where you have homelessness, which we have, you know, and it's kind of tragic. So everybody, the burden gets passed down the chain. Right. And uh, people who need affordable housing get priced out, and all of a sudden they don't, they're homeless. I mean, it's just, it's a tragedy that should not be happening. Um, so this is a big solution. You know, of course, politics are really tough. You know, you know the idea of infill housing um, is something that scares a lot of communities. They think, oh, other people are going to move in here. They're going to change the politics. They're going to change the culture. You know, there's a lot of people that are up front. I don't want low income population in my community. So um, those are the barriers and they're real. Yeah. yeah here's another thing is, is something we've we've chatted a few folks about um, and, and trying to understand it from from both sides. I, I think what we're seeing now is starting to see in Texas with you know a lot of California coming over here. And, and what I, I almost guarantee you all are seeing now is. This is no longer low income only problem. This is affecting, you know, even in the Bay Area. Everybody in Texas knows the barriers where where all the stuff we use on our phone comes out of. But behind that, there's there's teachers and first responders and, and folks it. that aren't making, you know, Bay Area developer money that need to be a part of that community for the community to function. Um, it is it's this also solution- astounding to me that people can't get used to the idea that they ought to at least build housing for the people who take care of the community. Uh, The idea that, you know, everybody who takes care of the community has to commute in drives me nuts. But, you know, once again, we are in a very bizarre political world. We did the same analysis of L.A. County. Uh, Just one county alone has close to 20,000 acres of strip commercial which could produce 1.6 million units of housing. So, you know, between those two, we got 3 million units. This actually solves, without going anywhere else in the state, it solves the state's housing crisis. Wow. So um, these are, you know, I just don't think we can piecemeal our way to solving a problem that's as big as the housing crisis in America. We've got to come to systemic solutions. Uh, it's not that we're saying no to more subdivisions. It's just that we have to add to the mix a choice that lets people live in a more urban lifestyle, walkable and local destinations. Um, you know, just that that choice needs to be available. And then the market can proportion things as is appropriate. But right now, ours, all our land use policies are leaning towards remote subdivisions, and that's just not functioning anymore. How do you live on an arterial? This is one of my projects. These are ground floor um, live work. So these are little offices on the ground floor of your house and your living room is on the second floor. So you're up and away from the street and you actually have nice long views. And these are townhouse style units with parking in the back. You know, the idea of live work used to be radical, but now after COVID, the idea that you're going to work at home, it's not such a weird idea. Um, <laughs> right. You know, so if you have a little office space on the ground floor of a street, you'd say, oh, that's too busy to live on. But it's not too busy to spend two or three days a week working there. And I, I think in the end, people are going to go back to work in their central office, but not full time. Mm-hmm. Um, so these are really healthy options for people. So right now in China, they have these autonomous buses and they literally just paint a line on a street and then it goes. Let's go. You know, 50 percent of the transit costs are in the drivers. So, you know, if we're going to make transit real, it's got to do two things. It's got to be faster than getting in your car and it's got to be cheaper than it is today. Much cheaper. So I think we, the new technology is going to get us there, and it's kind of exciting. In 
uh, Singapore, they have these little vans running on dedicated auto free streets. And because they're auto free, um, the autonomous technology works today. You know, it doesn't have all the complexity and liability of driving around um, mixed flow streets. But it allows you to get on a van that goes direct to destination. So it's like an express service. You don't have to stop at all the, the in-between places. Now, it may stop once or twice more to pick up other people going to the same destination. But all of a sudden, the average speed of the trip goes way up. Um, the operations and maintenance costs is cut in half. And the construction costs are, are, are way down. Because, of course, this is... At grade, you know, it's really just repaving and landscaping. So that's a, a vision for what I call next generation transit. And I think it's coming soon. Yeah, I think that's important to talk about in, in, in this context. What You know, from my experience with public transportation, um, you know, typically takes quite a bit longer to go from point A to point B than if you were uh, if you were in your car. And that's, you know, it sounds like that's one of the biggest barriers this proposal would, would eliminate. Yep. Yep. And it would solve the housing crisis at the same time. And building the housing would pay for the transit. That the beauty of the system uh, is that the, you know, the increased property taxes can pay for everything you want. Nice. Well, I can definitely you tell you're a uh, your professor. I, I felt like I just got a full on lecture um, <laughs> sitting, sitting here at, at home on, on Zoom. But, you know, I, I definitely learned a lot. And I think, you know, if I can take a stab at summarizing it for, for our audience, really what what transit oriented development is, is is an idea that if, if we put work and put housing and put effective transport port all together, we can take use of properties that um, you know, between Amazon and COVID just aren't going to be used to support our communities as much as they might have been in the past and, and really solve this affordable housing uh, problem in, in a big, big way. Um, you know, one thing when I was looking at that at, at your slides there and some of the projects you all have built um, here in San Antonio and in, in Texas, we, we see a lot of um, particularly new home home buyers that that want that lifestyle. They, you know, they don't want the lifestyle where they have to drive to everything. They want to walk to their restaurant and walk to their job and walk to the dog park. And um, it, it sounds like this addresses the affordability, but also the the market demand for for a, a an urban walkable lifestyle. Yeah. Um, now listen to this. Uh, how many households? as a percentage in the United States, you think are families with kids? Because that's kind of the, the image of the cul-de-sac is always about mom and pop and a couple of kids, right? right? What percentage of households do you think that is? I'd say a third, if I'm guessing. It's 24%. Wow, that's a lot less than yeah. I, I was thinking. No, back in the 60s when we had this whole, you know, American dreams, suburban style, uh, it was like 56%. And so our demographics have changed. What you're pointing out is that, hey, there's 75 percent of the population that are singles, single parents, young people, elderly. You know, there's a whole bunch of stages of life and income groups that don't need or want a remote um, house on a lot on a cul-de-sac. I mean, that's a phase of life for a certain income group. Um you know, so there's such a big demand for other, but it's got to be good. It's got to be complete. And then transit comes along and makes that walkable area that much bigger because you can walk through your neighborhood, do a few things, hop on um, a van on a dedicated right of way, be at work maybe 10 miles away. And you're, you know, you just don't have the expense of a car. Car costs like $5,000 a year per house per unit. Uh, you know, it's it's a big expense. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's going to give up all their cars, but they may go from three cars to two or they may go from two to one. Right. Um, yeah. Depending on the environment, people tend to pay these things in absolutes and they're not. I mean, this is about creating more choice. Yeah. Um, and I think that if, if the choice is there, we're going to see a much healthier set of communities evolve.
Well, I definitely agree. Now that I, I know what transit oriented development is, I, I always like learning new things myself, uh, and I know our audience does. And, and we'll we'll put those slides up and, and share them for for reference on on the video version of this podcast. If, if those listening want to see the slides that Peter and I were just uh, talking through, for folks that want to learn more about what you are doing um, and, and just this concept of transit oriented development. Um, where, where, what are some resources we can point them to, to to learn more about what we discussed today, Peter? Well, they can go to the uh, Congress for New Urbanism's website. Um, you know, my stuff, I don't have a single point where you can go and find it. Uh, the, the Grand Boulevard's proposal is, you know, I did a, a TED Talk that covers this material, but also covers issues outside of the United States. It was more of a global perspective on housing in cities but that you can look that up okay and that's just able to look at yeah we'll we'll be sure to put links to um to the ted talk we'll find that for our audience um and and then put some links to uh what the overall congress for new urbanism has been working on but I, i've learned a lot uh for sure peter and i i think this is something that that would work just the same here in texas we're, we're getting more and more of these problems coming at us and um, that, this makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways down down here as well. So yeah, thanks good. for joining us and sure. appreciate you being our first guest of the new year. Hey, and thank you for having your uh, focus on something this important. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Bye. Well, great to meet you. Have a good one. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of the Double Wide Dudes. Uh, appreciate Peter joining us. And as always, appreciate y'all tuning in and we'll catch you on the next one. Safest, easiest, lowest priced. Find a better way home with Broston, the nation's first virtual home dealership. Call us or visit us online at findmymobilehome.com.